Hi kitty cats. Today on the show I want to talk about big changes that are coming to the Medium Partner Program, what they mean to me as well as what they mean to other writers on Medium. I also want to talk about how I conquered a major transgender challenge, which is to say I have finally found shapewear that I can appreciate. And then finally I want to talk about an investigation into UFOs that are that's currently being conducted by a congressional committee and how that means that aliens are just like transgender people, at least to Christians. I am your hostess, Amethyst Herrick, and I want to welcome you to the program. Whether or not you know this, all of my work is supported by subscribers to my Substack publication. If you are already a subscriber, I want to say thank you so much. If you like this content, if you like this show, if you want to support me and all the other work that I do, including podcasts and writing, my Substack publication will be linked in the show notes. Just a couple of, uh, of bits about subscribers. When you subscribe to my Substack publication, you will receive emails every time I publish something, including shows like this. You're also able to interact directly with me through Substack, which, you know, could be fun, maybe. And finally, I am working on a new uh, identity and gender theory website that I intend to launch in August, and all of my subscribers are going to be, you know, put on to, will receive a subscription to that website as well. So, Medium's Partner Program. From now on, I'm going to call this the MPP because it's a little easier. There are big things kind of on the horizon here for the MPP. I'm sure it's clear I publish on Medium. I have a lot of friends who publish on, on Medium. I feel that I've found a community on Medium, not even just transgender, for writers, for a few communities, really. I've made a lot of friends through Medium, and I kind of feel like I've become part of something bigger than myself, you know, through writing on Medium. I have friends also who make a living doing what they do, publishing on Medium. I mean, not me, you know, that's why I need to go and make another website. But in a post by Buster Benson, I believe it came out maybe 10 days ago, I was going to talk about it last week and I ended up with other things to talk about. But Buster's post uh, goes over the MPP and details changes that are coming. Now, the title in, in the title to Buster's post, he mentions how these changes are going to, and I quote, Focus on high-quality human writing, end quote. So currently, if you look at the MPP, payouts that are, that are given to, or paid, I guess, payouts that are made to medium writers are based only on read time. So there is some unknown, or at least unknown to me, dollars per second, I guess, of read time here in the U.S. I mean, I suppose if you're elsewhere, it'd be different currency. But there's a dollar per second value that Medium knows and Medium uses so that every time somebody looks at one of my articles, well, every time a subscriber, be more accurate, looks at one of my art, uh, articles and reads it, that accrues time, that accrues, you know, seconds of read time. And then at the end of the month, I get paid for all of the seconds of all of my articles that I have asked, you know, to, to meter times this, this as yet undisclosed dollars per second payout rate. So that's how it works now. The changes that Buster detailed include the following. So rather than just the base payout being used, Medium is going to start looking at reader engagement. Reader engagement implies when you clap for an article, when you write a comment for an article, and when you highlight an article. And so there's a distinction between uh, claps and comments and highlights from people who follow you and people who do not, at least currently, follow you. And I think there was supposed to all, there was also supposed to be a multiplier added to if you, um, you know, if you gain a follower from that particular article. So reader engagement, this is going to now apply a multiplier to this base payout rate, the dollars per second that I mentioned. Boosted articles, as I've spoken about before, boosted articles are going to, a boost will enjoy another, um, 
multiplier. So, so another multiplier will be added similar to reader engagement, um, but boosted articles also will have the same distribution, the, the greater distribution, just like I spoke about, I think it was last week. I don't want to talk a whole lot about the boost. I am going to link to Robin Wilding's original article about the, the boost that she and I had spoken about. I think it really sums up all of my, um, all of my opinions about the boost. So I want to start now. Let's talk about reader engagement. According to Buster's article, reader engagement is supposed to encourage better writing. The idea being that, that you would be encouraged to write fewer but higher quality articles as opposed to uh, apparently a whole ton of, of crap ones. Reader engagement is claps, it's highlights, it's comments, and the idea goes that if you write good articles, you'll get more claps, you'll get more comments, more highlights. Read time, I want to point out, does not go away. The dollars per second is still the base way that Medium is going to pay us. These, this reader engagement is a multiplier added to it. So I just said added to it. It's a multiplier multiplied to it, I suppose. But it's applied to the base payout rate. So that doesn't go away. Now, I don't know... Honestly, if you're already getting good in engagement, like I don't think that's likely to change. If you're already getting claps and comments and highlights, and I do, I don't think that writing better articles is necessarily going to help. I have more to talk about that below, but I do want to think about engagement from followers. Now, I think that could mean something. And I think it means something because, you know, like I don't have a huge following, some 800 followers, I don't really know exactly. But I, I know that there are writers out there who have huge followings because people want to follow them in the hopes that those writers will follow back. And it's a way to grow your following, but it usually means that the people, and I've got plenty of these myself, I should mention, it does mean that these people are most likely not going to engage with what it is I write. So I think if you get a whole ton of followers but they don't engage with anything, I think that's interesting that, that you have basically repeat engagement. Somebody came to your article, said, wow, this person's great, good enough to follow, and then read more. And so I think that there's an aspect to that that, that kind of, you know, kind of grabs me. I sort of, I sort of appreciate that. Again, I think if you're already getting good engagement, I don't see any reason why that would change. Um, does it encourage better writing? I'm hesitant to agree with that. You know, if you just, in general, write engageable content, you get reader engagement. Now, when I say engageable content, gosh, is that a word? Engageable? Let's assume it is. When you write engageable content, that might be really good writing. It may be very emotional writing. It may just push the buttons of people who are reading your stuff. Now, I've written stuff that pushes buttons. I wrote something about the Bible. I've written about Christians, and Christians came and said, you're, a, you're an idiot. I'll buy that. Was that good writing? Maybe. Maybe not. They probably didn't follow me. Does it mean that I wrote something well, or does it mean that I pushed buttons? Because they're, the two would be very difficult to distinguish, I think. The other, the other point is that I think this is supposed to, to change whether or not people, whether or not AI content ends up getting on Medium. But I will reiterate, even if AI content is getting reader engagement, or if AI content gets this reader engagement, what's the diff? I mean, I don't see how this actually guarantees high quality content other than, you know, now I got no other other than. Where was I going? Probably nowhere. I see no reason why reader engagement, that changing how we get paid as a base, as a, based on reader engagement changes anything other than maybe getting me more money. And I'm not sure if that's gonna be the case. So, the boost. Many of us, in fact, a whole lot of us, almost all of the people I've spoken to, have experienced a drop in views like across the board. Um, I'm gonna take the guess, 
that not all of us suddenly suffered a drop in quality since the Boost program went live in February. Just a guess. Now, it could well be none of us wrote quality content to begin with, but I guess that you have to be the judge of that. Now, as I said, go and read Robin's uh, article that I have linked below. But our guess is that what the boost does is decrease the probability of any one article, unboosted that is, being seen, because Medium is promoting now these articles that have been boosted. And it doesn't make a difference whether you have an article that's great quality, that, that has phenomenal writing. It makes a difference. The difference there is whether or not you got boosted, which means somebody had to see your article, somebody had to nominate your article, and you only get a certain number of nominations per month. And then somebody uh, on the team that actually uh, like approves the nominations has to boost it, does the actual boost. So. I don't believe necessarily that the boost brings out high quality writing. I believe partly that there could be a black market for boosts. In fact, I would say that if you had the ability to, to clap and comment and highlight things and you know that this becomes a, a multiplier on top of read time, particular, particularly on boosted articles, why would you not just do that to everybody you know as a nominator? because then you can curry favor with them by indirectly paying them for your claps and your highlights and your comments and following them. So I don't believe that this is going to change too much with the way the boost operates as it is. Now, one of the points that Buster made was that the proportions of people in earning categories doesn't change and earning categories I believe he broke them down to like less than 10 bucks a month, uh, 10 bucks to 100 bucks a month, I think, and then 100 bucks to 1,000 bucks a month, and, and then, you know, the sky's the limit. The proportions of people in those categories doesn't change. But what that says to me, and maybe I'm wrong, but what it says to me is that the people in those categories do change. And if the those people in those categories, if those people change, is it necessarily because of good writing or better writing? Because why were they in these categories to begin with? If they were in those categories to begin with, presumably they were writing well, presumably they had reader engagement. So if the people change, my guess is that they change because Medium wants to promote them, which is what the boost does. And as a result, I still intend to hedge my bets by diversifying the channels through which I publish. And I guess more on that later. But now, let me talk about a very common transgender challenge. If you are not transgender, this may or may not apply to you, but I kind of guess it may anyway. One of the major challenges to transgender people is getting our body to present more as our preferred gender. So in the case of a transgender woman, somebody who is born male, but wants to present as a woman, or, well, let me start with those. For a transgender woman, we're trying to make our bodies look curvier, trying to make them look more feminine. Transgender men, who are assigned female at birth, but want to present as men, they're trying to reduce the curviness of their bodies. And, and in so doing, you know, it helps with um, percep the perception that we are you know, our preferred gender, that maybe I would have been assigned female at birth and a transgender man would have been assigned male at birth. Now, there are a bunch of ways to address this problem. The simplest one is clothing. You know, if you, like I, when I started HRT, hormone therapy, estrogen therapy, I ended up getting big, thick thighs and a big, huge butt. Many people can attest to this. It, but I realized what happens is since I've already got a huge butt, if I can get a shirt that kind of flares out, kind of comes in on the sides and flares back out, what that does is make me appear to be much curvier than I actually am. So clothes make a, make a difference here. I don't mean to, uh, to do the clothes make the woman, but there's partly truth to that. For transgender men, there are also, there's also something called a binder. And that's something that they put around their chest to flatten things out make them appear to have less in the way of a chest. And for transgender women, there's the opposite, 
we get uh, stuff to pad areas and stuff to hold other areas in. So we get, uh, I guess, padders and, and holder inners. Sure. All of that falls under the category of what I'm just going to call shapewear because you wear it and it gives you a shape. That's my guess. Now, I've put a lot of effort into finding shapewear because, you know, you can look at me. I'm not exactly a small girl. You know, I'm willing, willing to admit that. And while I responded well to the estrogen therapy in the past year, you know, you can almost always use more help. So that's what I'm going to talk about here. Um, originally, I had started with corsets. And corsets, I mean, I, I just, first of all, I really love the way corsets look. I bought a corset from Orchard Corsets, and I've linked to them in the show notes. That Orchard Corset, first of all, the people are awesome. They have great information on their site. Really amazing, just beautiful pieces of clothing. The one I have is black satin, and I mean, just a stunning piece of, of clothing. The other thing about a corset is that if your insides, so like right around where your female waist would go, if your insides are squishy enough, like if you can compress them, well, and I guess I can do that. I'm kind of concerned why that is. I have no idea. But if your insides are squishy enough, you can get a corset that really clamps down and can give you this amazing hourglass shape. Really just phenomenal. Now, the downside to corsets is that they're not really flexible. They've got steel boning in them. You know, that's how a corset works. They also tend to have, um, at least the one that I have, has a, a big shoelace kind of thing in the back and so it's laced in the back and so they're not flexible they're not comfortable learning to put one on you can do it i mean i learned to put on the corset by myself but you know certainly it's better if you can get like a squire or like a lady in waiting I'm trying to think what these would be called so you need that to, turn, to put it on corsets work okay under clothing the ties in the back will show. You know, if you have something like a tight top on, the ties in the back will show. And, you know, that kind of ruins the point of shapewear because you're just trying to show, hey, look, I got this shape. You can put it on over clothes and I actually have a few, there's been a few occasions that I've done that because it really is just a an amazing piece of fashion. But that might be a fashion statement you're not ready to make, that you have a corset on top of your clothes. I'm also curious, this didn't happen to me, but I'm curious if like, you know, kids are gonna walk up and just like untie your corset, you know, and then everything just whoosh, falls out. I don't know. I mean, it, like I said, it didn't happen to me and I don't know if there's exactly like this rash of corset untying going on across the nation, but you never know, right? Actually, I kind of wonder, like Victorian England, I wonder if that's what, you know, there's every day there was somebody walking down the street and a little child runs out, you know, Please, ma'am, can I have some more? And she goes, no, get away. I said, okay, untie your corset, ha ha. Getting back at the rich. I, I'll, I'll keep going. So the other, so those, that's corsets. Another thing that I tried were called waist trainers. Now, on, now a waist trainer in general, waist training, let me talk about that. Waist training is really like, like a thing. I hate using that phrase. But waist training is, is an, actual, an actual kind of thing. Um, the idea is that you put on a garment that is really high compression, so it's really stretchy and it really applies a, a bunch of, of pressure per unit area here, I guess. Um, and if you wear it consistently, it teaches your body, well, your body's smart enough to figure out, don't put body fat where it's really tight. And if you ever wore like really tight belts or something like that, and you ended up with kind of like a part of your body that shows where the tight belt was, it's kind of the same thing, kind of, kind of the same concept. So you do, for what it's worth, there's debate on whether or not that's true, waist training. In my experience, it kind of worked for me. I did get some, some body fat redistribution. Now that also happened in conjunction with estrogen therapy, is it all because of waist training, I don't know. So, you know, your mileage may vary. So as far as waist trainers go, I did actually buy a couple. I've tried a couple from a company called Angel Curves, which is great. Their, their website is slightly less, you know, fashionable looking than Orchard Corsets, also linked in the show notes. 
but they have actual dedicated waist trainers. These are generally big chunks of latex, big sheets of latex, so that you get this really high compression. But because they are latex, it sticks to anything. You put a shirt over it and like the whole, I mean like it's hard just to get the shirt over it depending upon how tight it is. So they're not really good under clothes because the clothes can move with your body as you move. Um, they also tend to be really tight, like really, really tight. With a corset, there was one time I put it on like when it was new, well, really even when it wasn't new, but there were times I put it on and I had to put on shoes and it was kind of like, oh. I could go barefoot. Uh, okay. With a waist trainer, it's a little better, at least a little, so they're more comfortable, but they are also really super tight. And so, you know, yes and no. So I've moved on to generic, what I'm gonna call generic is shapewear. These are really just the kind of things you can go down to, to the, the, the local shop and you find things that are elastic, things that are flexible enough that you can wear them out. They're not latex, so clothes can move over them, but they are high enough compression that, you know, they act as holder inners. So they're not waist trainer kind of compression, and they're not laced tight, tightly enough to strangle you, but, you know, that's where you go. So what I ended up finding recently is a, a maiden form waist trainer. They actually call it the maiden form waist nipper, which is a little concerning. I thought, I thought nippers were little, little things you use to, to cut like aluminum sheeting. I'm not really sure. I don't know that I want to do that to my waist. But I found something called a maiden form waist trainer, waist nipper, and I bought it because it was cheap. I mean, I think it was less than 30 bucks, which is significantly cheaper than a dedicated corset and, you know, probably half as much anyway, probably more than half or less than half of a dedicated waist trainer. So I'm gonna tell you, it actually works really well. I'm surprised, you know, by it. Um, I'm not gonna say this is gonna work for you, but I will say it's flexible, it's comfortable, and it's inexpensive. And at the very least, it might be worth a try. I don't know that my search is over, but uh, you know, I have something that works for the moment. And when you transgender, you go with whatever you got. So speaking of transgender people, I wanna talk about how transgender people are just like aliens. Now this, this story came to me, was brought to me by, by my friend, Bill. I won't give the rest of his name just in case he doesn't wanna be like affiliated with this, but he told me about a person, a man named David Grush. And I hope I get the pronunciation of David Grush's name correct. Now, David Grush was a former military intelligence officer. Now, I've seen it said former, so apparently he is not any longer. I don't know this story exceptionally well, other than to say that Mr. Grush went to a military facility to which he should have had access, as, as military intelligence officers would, went in there, tried to go in there to see what they, were, what they had there, and was denied access. Like apparently that, that concerned him. And I believe he went to multiple facilities and was turned down several times. Um, as a result, what David Grush did was begin, I guess, his own investigation and ended up discovering, and I'm gonna put the words discovering somewhat in quotes because I don't, I haven't read everything that he's discovered, so I don't really know. But he made a discovery that the United States government, as well as other governments, have been salvaging alien technology here on Earth for decades. Let me repeat that. What David Grush found was that the United States government has been salvaging alien technology that apparently crashed on Earth for decades. Now, is this true? I have no idea. There is a congressional committee currently investigating David Grush's claims. In fact, it started yesterday, Wednesday, the 26th of July. To me, a congressional investigation seems pretty formal. I mean, 
I've never been in Congress and I've never appeared before Congress, but usually that's pretty big stuff. So I don't know. That sounds pretty, pretty formal to me. There's also the possibility, and I'm throwing this out here just sort of spitballing, there's all, also the possibility that the United States government may be lying to some of its citizens or may not tell the whole truth to its citizens. Just throwing that out there. There are certain security aspects, you know, that I understand having to do with war, having to do with various things that I would get the U.S. government won't tell us about. I mean, and I'm okay with that, like more or less, you know. Are they hiding alien technology? Who knows? I have no idea whether this is true or whether this is false. What interests me, however, is the response. Because David Grush is just being destroyed in the media. A week ago, I discussed, because um, I, I put out my Gender as Mediator article, also linked in the show notes. And a week ago, on the, on the Dingbet Diaries Weekly, I discussed how I figured Christians might rebel against one of the, you know, about the, some of the science claims that I made. Because I talked about fish, and I talked about hyenas, and I used those to demonstrate a distinction between sex and gender in pretty much every other species in nature. I, I recognize very well fish and hyena are not the only species in nature, but for the most part, most species will demonstrate a, a decent um, distinction between sex and gender. And the response that I expected, and believe it or not, I actually got one in, uh, to my article. I was actually pretty happy to see that. The response was, and I quote, humans aren't fish. Well, you know, it's accurate, right? The point being made here is that humans are God's creation. Humans were made in God's, cre in God's image. And presumably God's not a fish. Although I do kind of wonder, there's that whole, you know, using the fish as a symbol. I don't know, maybe that bears further investigation. But humans were given dominion over the earth, right? D dominion over all that swims on the, in the sea, all that walks on the land. And so Christians rebel against the idea of comparing humans to other animals because humans are supposed to be in some way above animals. Well, if I'm human and I'm doing above, you know, humans are supposed to be above animals. I don't know, folks. I'm trying to do gestures. I mean, do they work? Not always. But a comparison, this comparison challenges the idea of a god. Does God even exist? Or has biology in characterizing and in classifying all of these species, has biology moved on and obviated, you know, the idea of religion? Now, to return to David Grush, there was an article, and I'm linking to it. It's from the San Francisco Gate. The, the article takes a very derogatory tone, ridicules the idea that Congress would, would entertain the idea of talking about UFOs. Now, I think that this response, this idea of ridiculing alien technology, aliens in general, is a similar response to what I think Christians you know, how they, how they responded to comparing humans to fish, only in the opposite direction. Because if aliens have reached Earth, this means at least two things. First of all, they exist. And humans are not the only creation, right? But second, they must also be more advanced than humans. And if humans were made in God's image, wow, what does that mean? Does alien, does alien existence disprove religion? But it kind of concerns me. I find it almost kind of scary that we would laugh at the possibility of another planet in the universe being capable of holding life. And furthermore, that we would laugh at the possibility that there are species that could be more intelligent than humans. Now, I believe this comes from Christian ideology really feeding not just 
philosophy, but the science of the Western world for, you know, a thousand years at this point. I guess a little less, but, you know, 500, 700 years. But I believe that's why that happens, that we, we're willing to take, you know, we're willing to make fun of the idea of aliens in a in a, a newspaper article. And this was, I mean, you know, think about this too. This was a newspaper article from San Francisco. San Francisco, geez, was the, was the weirdest thing you saw all day? Some guy testifying about aliens? You're in San Francisco. I can't believe that's the weirdest thing you saw all day. Maybe that was just a very sheltered writer. I don't know. In any event, before I close this down, I do want to say, you know, every time we consider the greatness of humanity, the intelligence of humanity, just whatever humanity can do, I want to remind everybody, just remember, we have things like Pee Wee Herman, people of Walmart, religious people such as Christians who try to weaponize their religion, and finally, scientists who choose to weaponize their science. Crazy thoughts. But with that, I will close down this particular show of the Dingbat Diaries. Thank you for watching the Dingbat Diaries Weekly for the week of July 27th, 2023. I remind you, if you enjoyed this content, please feel free to hit like, please feel free to subscribe, and if you really, really love it, please go find my Substack publication in the show notes and subscribe there. So until next week, I guess keep your bats stinging, whatever that means. See you next week. Bye.